is our um, second installment about uh, Western philosophy, East and West compared. So I wanted to uh, kind of compare Eastern and Western philosophy in a simple way, uh, especially the trends and the um, 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 phases that uh, Western philosophy has gone through and how the philosophy of the Vedas relates to that. And uh, so we're going to compare East and West today. And uh, this is our uh, Gita from Zero, session number 13. This is our um, excerpt, and this excerpt is about um, knowledge. So this is um, seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, verse two: "Gyanam te ham sevigyanam idam vaksyami ashevchataha yaj gyat va ne habuhyo nyaj yat tavyam avashishyate." I shall now declare unto you in, knowledge, in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and numinous. This being known, nothing further shall remain for you to know. Now this is a kind of mysterious sounding verse from uh, Krishna in the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, actually, Krishna is getting down to tell Arjuna specifically about bhakti yoga. So that's... Uh, the uh, f- main focus of chapter 7 of Bhagavad Gita. So up to that point, up to chapter 6, Krishna was telling Arjuna about all sorts of different spiritual processes and practices. And then in the end of chapter 6, Krishna finally uh, tells Arjuna what he really wants him to do, which is become a bhakti yogi. And now in chapter 7, Krishna is explaining what a bhakti yogi is, or he's going to, he hasn't done it yet. And um, so what this verse is, the reason I chose this as a comparison of Eastern and Western philosophy, is that um, what we know about this statement is that Krishna is suggesting that there are many kinds of knowledge, but what's the most important kind of knowledge? We could learn so many things. The universe is full of things that we could experiment with or we could learn about. But what is the most important thing to know about? And that most important thing is about the nature of our existence in the material world. What is it Uh, Why are we in the material world? What does material existence mean? How do we get out of material existence? And so Krishna is going to explain it to him. And if you have this knowledge, this is the best of all knowledge. And if you have this knowledge, we also know that there's nothing more. You don't You don't have to have all this other detailed knowledge. You can certainly have other detailed knowledge about so many uh, myriads of possible investigations. Uh, We can investigate so many things scientifically, philosophically, empirically, however you want to investigate. But this is the most important knowledge. And Krishna is going to explain it in a very uh, succinct way. And if you understand it, then you have come to the real bottom line of what we mean by knowledge with a capital K. You know, this is the real and the most important kind of knowledge. Questions about that? So, um, <clears throat> we touched on this a little bit in episode uh, or session 12. Uh, And Western philosophical thinking got off to a start with the Greeks. uh, Usually any time that you'll see 
philosophy discussed, Western philosophy. It starts with the Greeks. And for the longest time, you know, I wondered why it started with the Greeks. Because uh, obviously, um, people had philosophy before the Greeks. That, uh, you know, they weren't the first people to think about the world. But there's a reason why Western philosophy starts with the Greeks. And generally, the way I've seen it explained in many different places is that Western philosophy begins with the Greeks. Why? Because they rejected supernatural causes. Now, you might think that uh, the Greeks, they worship demigods. In fact, they did. You know, that's one of the things everybody knows about the Greeks is they had various demigods and Mount Olympus and they had all these uh, stories. But not these guys, not the ones that uh, we are uh, focusing on, the Greek philosophers. They didn't worship demigods. As a matter of fact, many of them were very much against the concept of worshiping demigods. We have uh, Xenophanes and others who spoke against worshiping demigods. So they not only gave up the idea of worshiping beings, they gave up the idea of thinking that uh, philosophy had anything to do with the supernatural. And this is why Western philosophy starts with the Greeks. Because in Western philosophical circles, when you throw out talking about demigods, you, talk, you throw out the supernatural, then you've started philosophy. This is real philosophy now. Even though they got off on the wrong foot right away, the Greeks uh, you know, had a lot of problems that they couldn't... Uh, you know. Uh, deal with, but Western philosophy starts off with accepting naturalism. So it's not at all surprising that in modern day, when we talk about philosophy, either in colleges or in scientific um, you know, uh, circles, that um, philosophy means naturalism. It means we reject the supernatural. Uh, now, it wasn't only they rejected the demigods, but with other religious systems, either uh, the um, Judaic tradition or the Christian tradition or the Islamic tradition or any other religious, they had the same issue because uh, Western philosophy was already rejecting uh, supernatural. So the supernatural things in Christianity were rejected. The supernatural things in Islam were rejected. The supernatural things in the Old Testament, in the Judaic tradition, they were all similarly rejected. So that's why uh, Christianity was at odds with Western philosophy for a long time until Thomas Aquinas kind of bridged the gap. That's a whole story in itself. So we should understand that Western philosophy has a serious prejudice right at the very beginning. At the very beginning, the uh, Western philosophical thinkers, these ancient Greeks, the pre-Socratics, they tossed out the idea that there was such a thing as, um, you know, at least many of them tossed out the idea of the supernatural. Um, there was some concept of the supernatural. Plato, to some extent, had a sense of the supernatural. Uh, but um, mostly, they kind of uh, decided that let's talk about laws. Again, kind of like preceding the Western concept that we have now of scientific laws. They had what they felt were philosophical laws back then, before they had scientific laws. And so um, with this kind of backdrop, we can understand this is why the Vedas don't really have much of a place in Western philosophy. Although they deal with the same issues, they answer the same questions, and they answer uh, the questions better than the uh, uh, Western philosophers did. And if you look at Western philosophy, it's hard not to sniff out the fact that the, uh, even these um, demigod uh, giving up worship of these people who, were these, uh, who rejected demigod worship, even they had 
little broken pieces of Vedic philosophy that uh, were part of their thinking. All right, so um, questions about that part. So Western philosophy just was born like in the beginning of Kali Yuga, so when the people reject the old supernatural, so and this philosophy start to rise, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, Kali Yuga basically started about 50 centuries ago in 3000 BC. I'm using really ballpark figures, you know, just to not get lost in the numbers, and there's dispute about the numbers anyways. Um, so at that point, uh, by degrees, Vedic culture declined. The knowledge was scrambled and lost to a large extent, uh, but it was to reappear later. And uh, during the time when it was lost or scrambled, um, there were other philosophies that came to replace the missing philosophy, because people have to have some philosophy for how they, they do things. So. Um, there was a basic philosophy of worshipping demigods, which is, uh, as I've said before, this is a worldwide phenomenon. In India, of course, they worship demigods. But in Scandinavia, they worship demigods. Egyptians worship demigods. The um, uh, Middle Eastern worshipped some kinds of uh, elite beings uh, we have in even, you know, like in uh, the Polynesian islands, in the uh, um, uh, what we call now the New World, or, you know, in the Americas, uh, Indians worshipped the, you know, persons who brought the rain, who, who uh, had. So this concept is a global concept. And the Greeks were breaking away from that. Um, and, of course, Vedic culture does not really recommend worshipping demigods. It recommends worshipping the supreme being. And we talked about that last week. But um, the Greeks were breaking away from that, but they didn't know what they were going towards. They were trying to build a philosophy based on not um, people and uh, various kinds of um, uh, uh, stories about the ancient past. They were trying to build a philosophy based on only laws, and their laws were, at this point, we aren't advanced enough to have scientific laws. We're only advanced enough to have various logical and reasonable uh, philosophical laws. And so that's what they were uh, propounding here at this time. So, what do we mean actually by materialism? Um, uh, it's sometimes called physicalism, at least in the modern day. It's called physicalism because it's not just matter. Uh, the physicists study energy and they study a lot of other things that uh, are a part of the interactive uh, you know, network of matter and energy, how they work together, and the phenomenon that they produce. So this is called physicalism, but it's essentially materialism, you know. It's, if we understand that matter isn't the whole story, that matter is also uh, added to by energy, and the, the uh, phenomenon that come about is the result of an, matter and energy interacting back and forth. But there's two definitions for uh, materialism. One of them is that everything comes from matter. That's the definition we're talking about here. But there's another definition for materialism, and that is that matter is the source of happiness, which is the more common you know, usually when people say somebody's materialistic, what they mean is that, that they want things and that the possessing things or such kind of, uh, you know, a structure of life is what gives happiness. So that's another definition. These are not the same thing, although they do work nicely together. You know, if you believe that everything comes from matter, then you want to enjoy matter. Obviously, that works nicely. You know, um, and um, 
physicalism supports the notion that there's only the matter of physics uh, and that is all there is. There are no causes beyond it. We, we rejected the supernatural. We've rejected the paranormal. We've rejected um, any subtle things that are not also definable in mathematical uh, terms that a physicist or a chemist would recognize. You know? So uh, again, we have this idea that everything builds up from tiny, small building blocks. Um, they used to be you know, uh, electrons and atoms, but now we find that the atom, the center in the nucleus has you know, uh, protons and neutrons, and those are in turn broken down into quarks, and so we have quarks and leptons, and now there's this idea with string theory that everything, even quarks, are built up of something even smaller. So maybe they'll find even something smaller eventually than that. But at any rate, we have some primitives, and by talking about how those interact, we can create an explanation of the entire universe that we see today with all the stars, planets, different forms of life, and uh, all the kinds of interchange that we have happening in our world. This is all, um, in theory, uh, deducible and explainable in terms of very basic material primitives. And of course these are not brought together by some intelligence. They only come together by chance random forces. And nevertheless, even though they're brought together by chance random forces, somehow or other, we have gradually increasingly more, increasingly more complex universe bubble out of it, you know, which beggars belief, even uh, not uh, only uh, on a, uh, uh, from the Vedic point of view, but even from the idea of, of um, entropy, which suggests that things get only simpler and not more complex. So what winds up the clock to begin with? We don't know. We don't have any uh, explanation of that. So if you believe this, you can see that this completely shuts the door on the Vedas, that um, the Vedas have nothing to give us. It's all supernatural stuff. It's all talking about soul. We don't believe in soul. It's talking about God. We don't believe in God. It's talking about reincarnation. We don't believe in reincarnation. It's talking about karma. We don't believe in karma. So, you know, uh, all these things are rejected if uh, you are convinced about materialism. So um, this is why Western thinking has gone down this road and why we encounter various uh, confusions and uh, difficulties in understanding what we mean when we're discussing the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, what, what do you have in this picture? What is this? <laughs> it's a uh, shopping cart. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> you know uh, people always are shopping for various things in the... Uh, in stores, but this is a shopping cart out in the and desert, snow, and it right? looks like it's been. Uh, I don't think it's snow. I think it's in the desert. It's uh, the beach. and it's uh, destroyed, you know, because that's our materialistic culture. It seems to be self-destroying. Our um, recently our uh, devotees, you know, have been discussing this, you know, our, uh, about how uh, the ecology is being destroyed by our, our materialism. So this is a, an outgrowth of this philosophy. If we're, very, if we're very materialistic, we tend to destroy the ecology. We tend to destroy the world around us. So uh, here we have moral relativity. So with the years going by, the centuries going by in Western philosophy, um, as supernatural causes were uh, uh, dis disregarded, we finally discover that we don't have any solid basis for morality. Of course, Kant, you know, in a more modern time, tried to find a solid basis for um, 
some kind of uh, morality. But in general, because we don't have any, any concept of another world, we don't have any concept of a supreme being in this uh, very materialistic uh, Western philosophical outlook, then morality sort of drifts with no, uh, nothing to anchor to. And most people can understand that morality is to some extent conventional because in one country something might be considered appropriate, in another country it might not be considered appropriate. Um, and people in general don't like morality because they feel, why should I be constricted? You know. However, on the other side of the coin, people are very terrified of the rising amorality of the world where uh, people don't have any ethics about what they do. You know, if they can steal money from you, they will. If, if they can get away with uh, physically abusing you and that gives them something, then they will. So we don't like morality or ethics, but at the same time, a world without morality and ethics is terrifying as well. Um, and what do we anchor it to? What, why do we uh, not do some things? Why do we actually do things? It boils down to a philosophical uh, understanding. So we allow people to believe whatever philosophy they want. But if we have a no philosophy of philosophy, then what do we base our legal laws on? What do we base our uh, governmental um, restrictions on. There's nothing to base anything on. And so um, even people who are atheistic, even people who are materialistic feel there should be some kind of morality, you know. But uh, what that morality is exactly, how we establish it, um, and uh, um, what it's based on has gotten lost in Western philosophy. So um, that's a whole issue in itself. But Gita is about ethics and morality. It's discussing what uh, morality is. And from a Vedic point of view, we know morality is whatever the Supreme Lord wants. Um, and usually um, we have general codes. Those are uh, dis uh, displayed in the laws of Manu and other places. And we find that there is a laws of karma, how one should live their lives, and so on and so forth. So um, this is how Gita finds itself at contrast with the moral relativism of this naturalistic Western philosophy that we are uh, growing out of, that Western philosophy that we were uh, was put into our crib along with the mother's milk, you know, when we came out of the womb. So, <clears throat> empiricism means that we want to establish everything on some kind of rigorous experimental foundational basis. And this is what science is all about. So, Western philosophy, after going through many changes and permutations... Uh, and each century had its own big questions. Each century had its own disputes. And finally, we have the rise of modern science, which is going to settle all the answers for us because it will do experiments. And based on these experiments, we will know what's real and what's not. We'll know how things actually work. But the problem is we can't study everything and the problem is that the universe is infinitely complex. As I say, the good news is scientists will never be out of a job. There's always something more to explore. And um, the, even the things that we know, we don't know them completely. We know, I, I call it Swiss cheese knowledge. We know some things about important aspects of our world but we also have big holes, gaps in our knowledge. And so we know something, we don't know the next thing over, we know again something else, we don't know that next thing over. And so in this way, we have a Swiss cheese kind of uh, knowledge that comes to us from science. That's not saying science is useless or whatever. Um, we certainly use science, we apply things, we come up with various kinds of um, 
mechanical and electronic contrivances that do useful things. Uh, but it doesn't give us thorough, complete knowledge. What it gives us is fragmental knowledge. And we discover that we can't put the dots together, that uh, the real big questions don't seem to be amenable to scientific investigation. Uh, we could ask big questions like, is there a God or not? Well, there's no scientific experiment we can do to prove he does or doesn't exist. Uh, we could ask the question, you know, does uh, the, do the laws of nature always hold in all circumstances? No scientific experiment anyone can do to establish that or not. Uh, was uh, the material nature today the same way when it first was created, you know, if we believe the Big Bang, you know, then, well, obviously it was different when it was first uh, the Big Bang, but at some point it seemed to stabilize out. Was it always the same? Were the laws always the same or not? We can't answer those questions. Is there a universe or a world beyond this world that we see? We can't answer that question. So the big questions don't seem to be in the category of science. You know, I always hear talking heads on various platforms in the internet say, you know, I wanted to be a scientist because I wanted to know the answer to the big questions, you know. I'm afraid uh, the big questions don't get an asked or answered by the scientists. They ask certain questions, but certain other questions are beyond their um, ability to answer. But that doesn't mean that they won't answer them. They'll speculate like anything which is just giving various kinds of speculative answers about something that they really don't have any empirical information about. But uh, they're certainly uh, um, open to, to talking about it. So um, this is empiricism and the uh, shortcoming of empiricism. We can't study everything even the things we know, we don't know them completely. The big questions don't seem to be open to scientific discussion, at least uh, to scientific investigation, at least no one seems to be doing that. Um, and we can't seem to connect the dots. We have so many fields of science which are kind of adrift. Of course, uh, the classic example is quantum theory and relativity. So we have quantum theory and we have relativity. Somehow or another, mathematically, those don't play nice with one another. And they want to find some universal mathematical um, system in which both relativity and quantum theory can nicely interplay, but they haven't been able to do that. But that's not the only place. There's so many places where there are fields of investigation where we have knowledge, but they appear to be adrift in the whole larger body of scientific information. Any questions about that? If we get an example in the modern medicine, for example, a right, short, right. short example. So, uh, Modern doctors still poking the finger all over just because they don't know the the nature how it works right. together. So, and we don't talk about physics or mathematics or even higher um, higher levels of knowledge, right? So that is just things. Even Greeks uh, consider the body as a, as a super like thing. What we have to just achieve in our life. I mean, I achieve all desires or whatever, so that's all we, mm, all we just tend to have, right? right? Our body, but we still don't know our bodies. So mm -hmm. that's why we cannot talk about cosmos or whatever in a big, in a big scale, just because we don't even know, have a full knowledge of a small scale, like, right, like right, our right. body. So the microcosm and the macrocosm, we have, um, there's so many things we don't know, uh, <clears throat> and that's why we can't answer the big questions, because uh, there's um, information that we would need to be able to answer the big questions, and so therefore um, we're left uh, without. 
However, the Vedas, the interesting thing is that here is a system of philosophy and explanation of the entire universe that's consistent, exhaustive, and plausible. So, you know, it's self-consistent. It doesn't contradict itself. It's plausible. We see that if we look at it, we think about it, it has the power to explain what's happening and it has the power to predict things, you know, so it's plausible. And it's exhaustive. It doesn't leave aside morality. It doesn't throw out consciousness. It doesn't leave aside human desire. All these things are encompassed. And uh, that scientists want to know details about how exactly electricity works or how... Uh, you know, uh, uh, electromagnetism works or any of these other things. There's no problem there. But uh, um, the, uh, the Vedas give us a full picture. So, <clears throat> in the earliest uh, days of Western philosophy, we have uh, three groups that emerged. You know, the idealists, the atomists, and the sophists. And uh, these three have interplayed uh, up to the present moment. You know, we have these, these certain uh, views. And uh, they were, you know, transformed and other issues came up. But uh, in the beginning, the idealists were uh, those who believed that there was another world that this world was only partly real. Um, and that is, of course, you know, Plato and supposedly Socrates. We don't really know details about Socrates. But that world was the world of the idealist. They felt that there was some other world. Now, they didn't have the Vedic conception of the spiritual world that we have. They had some very sort of mathematically or uh, abstract concept of what that other world was. Uh, but that was a world where there was a reason for morality and there was a reason for um, uh, choosing some things over others. Now, the atomists, they were materialists. They believed that there was only atoms and they didn't believe that there was another world. So they were, as we've been hearing, uh, this is way, way back there, you know. So this is at the time of, um, you know, Plato. You had the atomists, you know, and that there was only matter. This is Democritus and Leucippus and uh, those, you know. They uh, talked about how there were these tiny particles that were not divisible. And in the word, in the Greek language, tome means to divide, and atome means it's not dividable, so atoms are undividable. So uh, uh, they had a whole philosophy that went with it, but it wasn't very developed. Now, of all these groups, the most degenerate group was the sophists, who <clears throat> they were um, people who were skeptics. They didn't believe that there was any knowledge, that anybody could have any kind of knowledge. Because we see that people argue over things, <clears throat> and it's very difficult to establish a, a philosophical position. So they said, you know, the fact that human beings can agree on what's real and what's not shows that it must not be possible to know what's real or what's not. So why bother, you know? And, of course, they were uh, of the type that, you know, well, we can just enjoy, and that's all we need to know. Uh, no one knows nothing, no how, so we're, we're just going to enjoy. And uh, um, you should not worry about any kind of morality, because in the end it doesn't matter at all. And if you can get something from someone else for, uh, in what would be considered an a moral way, it doesn't matter because there's no reason to worry about that. So this is our very early beginnings of Western philosophy. And we can see these same themes in our modern world. You know, of course, people aren't sophists these days. Atomism is now a whole scientific uh, explanation of things. But 
in the Vedic literature, there's also the explanation of the atoms, which occurred way before uh, Democritus or Lucrippus. And there's some people who are idealists <coughs> who believe there's some kind of other world. Again, they don't know what that other world is like. However, the Vedas have a very detailed expression, ex explanation of what that other world is like. Questions about that? So, <coughs> these are the later trends <coughs> that... Uh, These are the later trends here that uh, we have the um, rationalists or empiricists. And uh, over time, you know, um, we have the German school, which was the rationalists, and we have the uh, English or British school, the empiricists, who had wrestled with the idea of where does knowledge come from. I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but uh, <clears throat> the rationalists felt that there was some kind of internal knowledge that we bring to us from somewhere else that, you know, uh, we don't need to study the world to understand some things. We do need to study the world to understand uh, other things, but there's some things we don't need to study the world to know. But the empiricists felt that there is no such thing, that... The only knowledge we have is what we have learned by going out into the world and fiddling with things. You know, that's how we learn things. So they were two completely diverse groups and they spoke against one another. And this brought us to finally the logical positivists, which were around the 1930s, you know, um, the rise of logical positivism. And their main premise was that if it isn't scientific, if you can't explain it in scientific terms, it doesn't exist. Uh, and they wanted to, in this way, set the bar for how humans should talk and how uh, philosophy should be handled and what science was all about, that they could prove and establish everything on a scientific uh, foundation. Didn't work. And this philosophy kind of evaporated. Uh, what's interesting, though, is many of the ideas, many of the um, uh, hopes and um, talking points of the logical positives, people say today, not knowing that during the, the 30s and 40s and 50s, eventually this philosophy bit the dust, you know, that uh, they weren't able to establish it, they weren't able to... Why weren't they able to establish it? Because there are plenty of things that are real that can't be explained in scientific terms, you know. Uh, uh, music, you know, I mean, you can talk about it in numbers, but uh, if you talk about music in numbers, nobody's going to go listen to a concert like that. You know, that, that's not what makes music music. Music is something very different. You know, you can't explain uh, happiness or um, self fulfillment or any of these things in mathematical uh, jargon. So, at any rate, the logical positives finally uh, wound up admitting defeat. But although the ship went down these ideas are still alive and well in modern uh, discourse and the way people are talking about it. We have now another group called the phenomenologists, which were people who were the opposite way. They were very much against the logical positivists. And they said the only things that we know are human experience. You know, We don't know what a photon is, really. We don't know what electrons are. But we do know that sometimes I'm happy, and when I see something, I know whether I like it or I don't like it. And these are the real essences of um, human experience. And those things can't be talked about in scientific terms. It's like primitivism, right? So just like I feel uh, that exists. If not, it's done, right? You can... We talk about, I mean, it's look like a primitiv primitivism. Like, if I feel it exists, if I don't feel it doesn't, it's just like simple. Something just, like yeah, that, yeah. right. But what they were, uh, they were a reaction against this 
very materialistic, scientific, um, naturalistic view that we don't know what human consciousness is, but we do know we have it. We don't know if we we're going to say, what is pain? You experience it, but how would you describe it scientifically? You know, uh, you see those things that you get in a hospital where it says, how much does it hurt? And it has a little face there with a, 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 a flat mouth and then it has one with a really bad mouth and it has one with tears coming out. <laughs> you know, I mean, that shows how vague, you know, in a scientific way these things are. Yet pain is real. And if I've got enough pain, I want something to help me deal with it. Start from zero to ten. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's all measurements of pain. Right, right, right. right. So th this is the point that we're making here, that uh, the phenomenologists point... Of course, they were very sensually oriented, you know, so that's uh, not really um, Vedic philosophy, but at least it was a reaction to the other way of looking at things, which tried to put everything into numbers and science and all, uh, all that. So this is um, how Western philosophy came to finally be a part of our lives when we were born. You know, all this stuff happened before and our uh, lives have been uh, tainted and colored by it. So this is my last slide for this uh, uh, section here, we're doing 13. Is there a place for the Gita? So, yes, there is a place for the Gita, but we have to bracket materialism. If you're going to uh, firmly believe in materialism, you're not going to be interested in the Bhagavad Gita at all. Um, at least you have to see that materialism has some uh, serious problems. And uh, you can put it aside for a moment and think about the um, explanations and the processes that Gita gives to change your life. And we can see now from Western philosophy how Western philosophy sets you up on the wrong foot for Bhagavad Gita in a number of ways. You know, we have this idea of um, naturalism, throwing out supernatural causes. We have this idea of uh, no real morality. We have this idea of uh, a uh, universe that's only matter and that everything bumps together and gradually gets more and more complex. All these are wrong axioms. None of them can be proven, but if you believe them, then Bhagavad Gita won't uh, have any um, uh, use for you. Um, and uh, the axioms of Western philosophy are constantly open to the possibility of change, whereas the axioms of the Bhagavad Gita are not. You know, um, uh, that doesn't mean that we can't find new knowledge. We do find new knowledge about the material world, but all these things are not the important knowledge. The important knowledge of this material world is why are we here? How do we get out of here? That's the important knowledge. Um, and... Um, Technical knowledge is certainly changing, and it's certainly evolving. There's no doubt about it that uh, we have way more technical knowledge than we have today than we had, you know, centuries ago. However, that does not mean that philosophical knowledge is evolving. Um, the same philosophies are always there. We, we've seen how the philosophies today are mirrored uh, it even back then in uh, the time of Socrates and Plato. But like, you know, uh, the way people do with music tracks, you know, they remix them, they make the bass a little louder or softer, or they make the drums or they change out the vocals or something like that. So philosophical knowledge is not evolving, it's only being remixed because there's no new philosophies. Uh, we're not discovering new philosophies. What we're discovering is new mixtures of philosophies that have already gone before, mixtures of materialism or naturalism or skepticism or uh, uh, idealism or whatever. So um, any final questions there? That's uh, 
That's our okay. So um, today we went through Western philosophy. I tried to put that uh, Bhagavad Gita in and the and the Vedic philosophy against the background of Western philosophy, so that we could see how this um, stacks up. What is the Vedic philosophy? How does it compare and how does it contrast with Western philosophy? And next week we'll talk about world religions, how uh, the Vedic system stacks up against various world religions. And then uh, on the 15th we'll talk about the science, supernatural, and mythology, which will bring this whole section to an end and we'll start Bhagavad Gita after that. All right, so... uh, Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna.